joining us. Oh, sir, my pleasure, Lonnie. Nice to be. Yes, I don't know if many of you know him, but Chami Gee is what we call an amateur science media journalist and researcher. I met him through really the YouTubes and Facebook. He posts uh, really great articles about Fukushima and about the lies of the nuclear industry. He tries to give us accurate information. He writes for a uh, online journal called uh, the blog uh, nuclearnews.org. I go there okay. regularly to get dot net. I go there regularly to get information. And um, thanks, John, for joining us. Okay, well, I'll just uh, refresh it. So nuclear dash is like a little hyphen news dot net. And uh, so uh, I've been doing that. Uh, I'll just sort of uh, uh, in- introduce uh, myself through that, I think. Um, I was uh, on any news many, many years ago after the Fukushima disaster. And um, uh, many pe- many of the posters on uh, commenters on any news were digging out, trying to find out what the hell was going on and what the nuclear industry uh, is all about. Um, and then I got offered, uh, after a, a certain amount of time, uh, I got uh, offered a, a position in nuclear-news.net with, uh, by Christina McPherson, who was, uh, who had been running that blog for about eight years <clears throat> prior to Fukushima. And um, she, you know, had a very small sort of uh, uh, close-knit sort of uh, community that were, were keeping an eye on it. She was uh, very prolific and she'd get you know, 10 posts a day up, uh, anything to do with nuclear or mining, uh, uranium mining or anything in that sort of area. Um, <clears throat> we sort of built up the, between the two of us, we built, built it up. I, I had a bit of social media skills, so <clears throat> I was able to share uh, and let people know that the blog was there. Uh, our our uh, subscriptions increased, our daily hits increased. Um, and you know we we, we had uh, we've got pro nuclear people that go on it because they can't get that, that sort of information anywhere else. It's a nice central place they can go to to find out the dirt in their industry. And uh, of course, most of our uh, sort of uh, people were basically uh, sort of anti nuclear. So they're scientists, they're reporters who were just checking up to see what was going on. And um, we basically just kept developing it and and during that time I you know I'd made contacts with journalists and scientists and and other people we would basically uh, started networking and sharing information and uh, I can't, that's kind of where I got to uh, I think after Fukushima as well especially in the early days I was sending information to uh, uh, sort of NGOs in Japan like Green Action Japan you know anti-nuclear NG- NGOs uh, I was uh, NGO uh, uh, that's, that's non- non-governmental, non-governmental organization yeah non- so uh, but um, they, they were anti-nuclear group should we say and, and various other anti-nuclear groups and individuals in Japan um, I was also involved with um, uh, helping translate and disseminate uh, Japanese information to the to uh, to the UK. I did that with uh, uh, one blogger called Tokyo Brown Tabby, who was chased off the internet by the Japanese government. Um, and then uh, a bit later on, um, I linked up with someone in England who, who was you know uh, not a professional translator uh, but was able to get most of the information from the blogs and uh, basically and the twitter feed and everything from fukushima and was actually a a, a, a you know had come from fukushima and had family in fukushima so she would uh, translate the information down to a certain point but the the english would be a bit rough and i would come in and i would um, I would uh, clean up the the English, the, the grammar, and everything, um, and then basically I would uh, lay it out, and then I would promote it. You know, she had her blog, but it was a very small <coughs> lit, uh, sort of uh, readership. Uh, but we would we would uh, counter post all our stuff uh, mm-hmm. onto nuclear news dot net. So um, we, we've got uh, we have people from all over the world that um, that, that actually link onto that blog, um, and we got we, we covered some stories that probably took two years or so before it came to the mainstream, even three years, uh, you know, about uh, the, the, the rivers around there being radioactive and what have you, uh, children born with polydactyl, um, uh, that's an extra finger or uh, an extra toe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's ha- very common in Chernobyl. Also. Yeah, well, it, it was for the first seven years and then it petered out and it's probably going to be similar in Japan where they'll, they'll have a, a rush of them. Uh, after two years, there was a 100. And there should have only been about six or, or eight, maybe ten, should we say ten. 
Um, but but there was a there was a hunt, <coughs> there was about at least ten. Well, that's years. this generation. I mean, what does Dr. Caldecott say? It's really you don't really see start seeing it till eight generations later. That's um, it really yeah, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, the, you know, when we look at places like um, semi palantisk uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, we see that um, that these uh, uh, these sort of dif- that they, they happened within a few generations. But that was quite a you know, they had bombs going off, and they were just they were just down the road from them, and they had to cover they covered themselves with blankets, and, you know, and things like this. Um, and then they were studied by the Russians to uh, see what the effects were. Um, and now, of course, they have to have um, uh, genetic passports. So, and they can't have children unless the government says they can. What? 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 I had not heard of that. Yeah, no, that's 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 a that's a fact. Um, so that's in Russia. That's, that, in, that's Russia? in Kazakhstan. It, well, it, it was part of Russia at the time. It's where Russia did uh, some of their nuclear testing. Um, and they did. Wow. Some, they did some up uh, nearer to Finland in the north as well. So they're not allowed to have children unless the government says well, that, they can have children. Well, that's theory. Ch- I mean, they do anyway because what they do is they, they just run away, yeah. have the baby, and uh, for yeah. instance, there's a very famous film called After the Apocalypse where this uh, one yeah, there was a family they were quite quite badly uh, disfigured. Um, and um, this young lady wanted to have a baby, and the doctor said, "No, you can't. You know, you must have an abortion." Do 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 do. And uh, she went away, had a baby, and the baby was normal. So you know, this it's, it's um, that's the thing about and the babies. This is the hard part. The baby's normal this generation. See, this is what this is what Dr. Goffman said this morning when I was reading this portion about human rights. He wrote that in his book on irreverie. I forget the title: of the irreverie history of illustrated view of nuclear power. The irreverie. He had this whole section about human rights and how this is murder. It, we are murdering millions of people, and it's not just this is really a sick experiment it is really unkind it's so unconscionable because we don't even see the worst cause of it all yet you and i are going to be dead before the worst of these genetic mutations take shape well not in kazakhstan i'm afraid but uh, and there are other places as well where we see these uh these uh i mean if you look at uh, the um uh, the court case in the uk um, which was happening this year. It came after, what do you mean, after, not in Kazakhstan? What do you mean? Uh, well, that's uh, semi palantisk where you can see these uh, these uh, severe deformities. I mean, the UK scientists were, well, it was actually a, um, a Professor Geraldine Thomas uh, went to the screening of uh, After the Apocalypse in London, and uh, she took over the place from a geneticist, right? <laughs> so she, she, she does thyroid wow. cancer. Um, and they, they didn't have any geneticists on there, and uh, of course, it was obvious that there's there's issues there. But she was saying, well, actually, what she said was that uh, it's because they smoke cigarettes and they drink alcohol. And uh, right. she, then she went on about the facts. And this comes. When was that? I think I remember hearing about this a couple of years ago. Sure, Wasn't I did. Just... I did an article. I did an article on it. And I probably read your article. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, it was, it was crazy. And, and it, one thing I, it's I, been it's, awesome, Sean. I'm so glad that you're joining us on the show, to be honest. It's really awesome because this is one of the things I talked to uh, Carl Grossman uh, this afternoon. I'm going to have him on my radio show. And I really want to address this thing about anti-nuke. The new anti-nuke movement is somewhat fragmented. There's a huge portion of people on YouTube. There's a lot of citizen journalists like you who have really educated. There's a lot of people, several people, who have educated themselves on this issue uh, and have their own YouTube channels and are doing really great work. And then there's this whole bitter backfighting. And part of it is that uh, why I'm glad that you're on is you're a citizen journalist who is making his way. Like you're You're an amateur science media journalist and researcher you have done this because you're compelled because of what happened to find out the truth and in doing so you're becoming somewhat of a semi-expert you haven't had the education but you're you have the mentality where you really could uh, can understand the science of it all that's how you're able to write these articles for these you put it into simpler terms for people like me like when i I recently read a scientific journal on my YouTube channel. Can I tell you the nuts and bolts of what was said? Probably not, but I got the general gist of it. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't. We we need people to come together because we need millions and millions of people to understand how threatening this is to life on our planet and to stand up and demand an end to it and answers for the pollution it's already causing. Well, I think uh, you know, you know, as as citizens, as all of us as citizens of the world, right? Uh, we basically we have to sort of rely on the information that's out there. Um, and there is some information out there, and it's generally buried in quite technical uh, documentation, and it's very hard to dig out. And if I might, I, I, you know, I can give you two examples, actually, if you can give me a few That minutes. would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. let me see. Um, we, have, the, the, we have 46 minutes, 45 minutes left, so... Sure, right. Well, I'll, I'll, this is, I'll, if you can give me about five minutes, I'll just quickly go through it. There was a, a, a story that was brought out in uh, Science Daily, and what they were saying, basically, that Chernobyl's birds adapting to ionizing radiation, right? That was the headline. Mm -hmm. So you can see, see what's going on there. And that was in response to an article that Professor Timothy, Timothy Mousseau did. Now, I, I, I read that and I thought, her, huh? And, uh, it didn't seem to tie in with what his actual, uh, his actual study had done. So, but I, I wanted clarification. So I contacted him and, well, I just sent him an email, actually. And I said, look, what, what's this uh, about uh, the Science Daily saying that, that you know, claiming that uh, the, the, these birds are all adapting to ionizing radiation and giving the impression that everything's okay? So I basically contacted him. I explained it. He turned around and he actually did a rebuttal. So we, we, that was actually put up. So if you, you know, it, he basically said, look, you know, some birds, like the, the birds with black pigmentation, this is this is the simple version, the birds with black pigmentation, like crows, uh, basically were able to adapt, right? But everything else, all the other diverse bird species, or, you know, quite a lot of them had disappeared. So what, mm -hmm. what, what he was saying, and were suffering quite badly, but these, these, these crows, you know, because crows are pretty hard, aren't they, anyone? But they, they were able to adapt. But here's the but. Which you know, once again, Science Daily. You know, this is where you get your information from. Uh, they basically kind of ignored the fact that in this document it was saying that these birds did it, but they did it at the expense of their evolutionary uh, ability. So, th the things that allow us to evolve, the chemicals in our body that allow us to evolve, basically were being used to protect the birds from radiation. So that's a great win for the pro-nuclears. The downside is that the birds were no longer able to evolve in that environment, in that radioactive environment. So that was it. That was where they were. Any changes to the climate, you know, in, in cl global warming terms or whatever, those birds were going to suffer because they wouldn't be able to adapt to the climate because those chemicals, I won't get, you know, I won't get technical on you, but those chemicals that, that, that would help them to adapt you know, to, to a warmer or wetter or drier or whatever environment would be basically being used to protect them from radiation. That, that would, so therefore, you know, the, the idea that Chernobyl, Chernobyl's birds adapting to ionizing radiation is a very blinkered view, right? So, and, and once again, it, it took, um, it took myself just to send an email. You know, any, Science Daily could have sent the email and said, well, what do you reckon on, on this article? Do you agree with it? You know, they didn't. You know, that because there was a bit, you know, uh, I think the term I actually, you know, the headline I put on it was how to spin a radioactive mm -hmm. bird during Chernobyl Remembrance Day, which it was, mm -hmm. using Google and Science Daily. OK, that, so so that was one. And I'll, go, I'll come to another one quickly, you know. And, well, they uh, never take into account the harm to life. They only will talk about the things that things overcome. It's well, like I, I, Dr. I'll Gilmedic. explain what that's about as well so what i'll do I'll, I'll give you the second example and then i'll explain who's behind it right now that's the interesting thing so uh, the second one i did i was uh, i was on a an article in japan times uh, which uh, was about dana Dern, dana Dernford, and um and they were saying that he was a big nuclear he was the main uh, nuclear anti-nuclear activist and how evil he was and then you got into the comments and and the usual uh, sort of pro-nuclear trolls uh, their actual um, uh, uh, nuclear health physicists from USA would be in there and they'd be going yeah he's out of order blah 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 and you know to be honest they would be picking apart his arguments in in you know in basic you know they didn't even have to break sweat but then I started on them and I was sort of saying well look you know 
there's a load of nuclear health physicists from a rea- uh, from a, a, a nuclear site that were involved in a knife fight where a load of people got uh, killed, and they were they were actually hell's angels, you know. So you know you're saying that you're you you know you're honest, and it, so we we got into a big fight, and in the end I then started mentioning the thyroid cancer cases. Now, this is about a year ago, was not it? You know about that time, and so we got into the cancer ca- uh, cases, and they said that eventually. They came up and said, well, look, his, his, his report is wrong because of this. And they gave me a list of six or eight uh, things that were wrong uh, with uh, Professor Toshida Suda's thyroid study. Right? So what did I, you know, I said, and we were all, this is going on in the Japan Times over three or four days. You know, we, we were really at it. And um, so basically we turned around and I said, look, I'm, I'm going to contact Professor Suda and I'm going to put these to him and we'll get, we'll get a response. Um, now it's too long to put on the Japan Times, so I'll put it onto my blog, and I'll send you the link to the blog. And you know, Japan Times, fair play to them, they kept the the, the uh, thing open because they could see we were having a a good argument about about you know is there children's thyroid cancer caused by radiation or not, all right? So anyway, I did contact him and um, I sent him an email uh, once again, and then basically he turned around and he responded within two days. Within two days. OK, so, you know, he, 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 every single point that they made, basically, he rebutted. He rebutted it really well, nice and clearly and concisely. He was Japanese, but he was able to, in English, write all this down. And I was able to sort of make a, a blog post on it, you know, and it got 50 hits. <laughs> but but at the end of the day, it was great. So and this guy, I think it was called Sam McGill, or I, I don't know if that's his real name. This is the the uh, nuclear health physicist from the USA. Who you'll you often see these guys on uh, um, uh, what's it on uh, sort of the Guardian every time they have a nuclear story or whatever. Yeah, the pro nuclear. Yeah, like yeah. They, they um, make a point of looking and making comments sure. about how. So I, I'm 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 dealing with three of them on the Japan Times. But anyway, so I I just I got the response. I put it up, and and then they came back and goes, oh well, no, that's not right, and then they put up a load of others now of course the clever thing here was was that that if if i hadn't said anything they would have waited six months sent him those eight points he would have rebutted them they'd have waited another two months or something or three months or six months and then they'd have given him another load of questions but here's the thing they actually gave me all the the next round of questions this is this is what they do when you're trying to do a peer review study uh, you, you, you know they just delay it for years and just keep hitting you with these questions after questions that, you know about yeah. the you know oh look you put a full stop in the wrong place you did this you did that uh, and then they have to go away rewrite it resubmit it and that's how the peer review process works but what had happened was is that i was able within a few days able to give uh, uh, Professor Suda the arguments from the nuclear industry, which he hadn't got yet. And then their their response was another 10 points. And I sent him those. <laughs> so that, but the point is, though, it's not he didn't I didn't ask for a rebuttal, but it was really just to say that there you are. You've got 18 arguments they would have used on you over the next year or so. Well, you can answer them now and then they have to go. They have to just dig around and find more things, which was making Professor Suda's uh, sort of study, uh, very uh, strong, but my, it was it was uh, uh, quickening the process of the peer review, you know. So that well, I have to say, I've never really engaged on any of those blogs, like on E and E News, or sure. I don't like to put comments down. Yeah. You know, mostly I just to be honest, the reason I don't is I don't think we convince anybody out there. I think we're just, you know, they're paid to stick to the point. Yeah. And, and honestly, this was my point to Dana, Dana and I, I have to say, I think it kind of made him mad, was that I said, no matter what we do, no matter who's saying what, we have not changed their mind one bit. The train, Germany is now going to pay the nuclear industry money because they got they won in court for lost compensation. We are building nuclear power plants in India, in China. They are happening. The United States is building nuclear power plants. The United States is increasing money for its nuclear. Our efforts, you know, we're failing. Let's just be real. They're not hearing us. Their fingers are in their well, ears. They're like, I, la, I have la, to la, say, la. I have to say one thing here. Is that, uh, and I'll use the UK as an example. Now, in 2013, right, the uh, the, the five big insurance companies uh, basically turned around and they had invested 350 billion 
on uh, in, into nuclear uh, over the because they started a big campaign in the UK about 2005. It was to do with mox fuel and all this type of stuff and promoting nuclear and everything else. Uh, and what they did, of the, course, the, the insurance companies, they invested 350 billion. Now, by 2013, because of what bloggers were doing, not just me, but, you know, you, yourself and everybody else, any time you post anything up on the Internet, it was being picked up by the financial blogs. And it was it, and instead of just having uh, and we'll come back to the uh, who, who's behind the uh, Science Daily articles and, and why that comes out. But they were basically turn around. They put three. They, they basically realized that for, uh, that the nuclear industry was a dead duck. So the insurance companies pulled the money out, 350 billion in the UK, and then they invested it in something called a, a PFI contract, which was basically building roads and schools. Uh, but they're very lucrative. So over 40 years, you get you get 10 times up to 10 times the money you put in. So that's 10 times 350 billion they were going to get. Now, who when they pulled the money out of the uh, nuclear industry, the tax man put the money in. OK, to, to, to cover it. OK, so that that's that's kind of that's the mechanism. So it doesn't matter if the banks are be, you know, say, you know, sorry, if somebody's suing uh, the government for this or that. Nuclear is a dead duck, in my opinion, and it's getting more dead by the day. And and, you know, the big insurance company, the big investors. Along with now, us, Sean, that's the point. It's yeah, like, the, really, the big, they have the already done their into, damage. Uh, the big investment into TEPCO uh, was a Norwegian investor. They pulled their money out after nearly year one. It was by year two. They pulled their money out of TEPCO with loss, right, because they know that it's a dead duck. Now, what, what's happening is, so how, how, how comes it's still going, you may ask? Well, the reason it's still going is because of companies, and this particular company was involved in the BP Gulf oil spill, Fukushima disaster. They work for the governments to um, basically minimize the damage right, to uh, the nuclear industry. And how they did that was that uh, it's called WPP LLC. Look them up. And uh, we did uh, quite a few articles on nuclear news about it. Um, and then what they would do is that they would manage, um, and I've done articles on the BP Gulf oil spill, and their name ca- cropped up there as well. WPP? So, WPP LLC, right? So uh, basically uh, the guy in charge is called, guy called mm-hmm. Sir Martin Sorrell. And uh, so they would basically um, uh, go to, go, go to uh, um, uh, Prime Minister Abe and say, look, we'll manage this for you. So what you would see that they had complete, they had advertising, uh, newspaper contracts that they had the money. They would give them to the newspapers and all the rest of it. They had top notch solicitors. They had security companies hassling the, the locals and they did in Louisiana and they did in Fukushima. And then the next little thing, which you might have noticed in the first year was the, uh, buy your radioactive carrot from Fukushima, but you know, and all this kind of campaigns they did. And they're doing, uh, tourism campaigns at the moment. And they go worldwide, you know. So if you click on Fukushima at certain times, you'll just see, oh, Fukushima, go there on holiday, or buy their food, or look, uh, sake, you know. And they have they have uh, um, uh, drives, you know. And the, the, there's a one company behind that. In this case, it's WPP LLC. There are other PR companies, you know, um, uh, who also are involved. Um, they they are all sort of like a, a little buddy network. Um, but uh, the, you know, WPP LLC. Uh, well, let, let me explain this about the PR companies. In the last recession in 1980 or whatever it was, the PR companies were going out of business because people didn't advertise. Right? They didn't have the money to advertise. So they, they were cutting back and selling buildings and all the rest of it. After Fukushima, their profits went up right? because they were getting money from the government. All right? It's more taxpayers' money from Japan or from uh, USA if it was Louisiana or in the case of UK you know you've got other uh, UK uh, based and WPP are probably involved and in Ireland with Shell Oil and all the rest of it that they basically come in and they manage the situation and that is a quote from Sir Martin Sorrell by the way they manage the situation uh, for the government and uh, and that's what's behind it so who who's behind Science Media Daily who's the funder WPP, LLC, and, and companies like that. So at the end of the day, they've got uh, security companies that can go, you know, following people around, hassling journalists, uh, dogging doctors that are trying to speak up about it, uh, and all this kind of thing. So, so, so that's the mechanism. 
but all they're doing is just like it's like a, a, a sort of like a nice nice sweet icing over over a, a pile of, of can I say dog shit um, I hope I can but anyway that's what it is and uh, and they're very good at doing it and their profits have gone up and up and up and up and in fact they're much more in use now you know because obviously there's all this war with Syria and everything else so they're trying to manage the situation again you know they the, so anyway I won't go into that because the evidence you know is starting to come out and you can blog you know blog away and check out what's going on but it's all the same thing. I mean, it, the PR companies is really a propaganda company now, and the money is paid for by taxpayers around the world. And That's uh, the whole thing. That's the whole point. Yeah. This is why I talk about it all the time, because we're really just dealing with propaganda. That's really, we're just, we're being propagandized and gaslit to extinction. Yeah, but I mean, obviously you have to realize that the financial com- the financial companies, what they do when they 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 have they have a, uh, on the internet, for instance, they have a they have a tr- web trawling uh, bots, if you want to call it that, and that, uh, which automatically go around getting all the news. So, like for nuclear news, we put up ten posts a day. That's just one blog, right? And we put these ten posts up, and it's usually with pithy headlines like "nuclear is dead" or you know, sort of that, <laughs> like you know. Um, uh, confirming the Toshida Suda thyroid study and all this kind of thing, and 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 it counters the stuff that WPP are putting out, you know, like uh, like you know uh, proof that radiation is good for you kind of thing, and and what what the financial companies do, they balance balance up the ev- you know they look into it, they balance up the evidence, how many how many anti nuclear sort of uh, stories to pro nuclear, and if there's more anti nuclear stories. You basically turn around and they, they, they divest. They take the money out. And that's exactly what's happening. So what we're finding is, is that, that, that the tax... I don't think it's just because of the stories. It's because of the oh, reality. I mean, well, well, just look what happened just this week in the United States. The WIPP fell apart. Twelve inch, a twelve eight inch thick piece of the ceiling, the two-thirds the size of a football field, sure. collapsed in the United States. Yeah, and, and you know, but the thing is that the, in terms of the financial industry, they're not aware of that unless somebody says it. Now, if one article in one paper for one day comes out and says it and then disappears, their bots will pick up on that because afterwards you'll always see a load of really you know and this during chernobyl and all that the you know the the anniversary during the fukushima anniversary the bbc was running a oh there's nothing wrong with radiation and, and that's been completely debunked and and uh geraldine thomas once again who was uh who was uh over there doing this ridiculous uh video she they actually had to pull it in the end of bbc um and it's been debunked by top scientists you know even people that you might even consider pro-nuclear um, they turned around and said what she was saying there was dangerous. She wanted young, you know, children to move back into highly radioactive areas. Cause, and, and in fact, actually, she couldn't even measure the radiation. You know, she couldn't count, basically. Um, but even so, afterwards, she said, well, there's still no problem. But at the end of the day, what she was saying was dangerous, you know. So, but, but for, for her, for the BBC, they did that story, but there was a lot of anti-nuclear stuff going on at the time. Um, and then since then, she's been completely debunked. And she was, you know, going back to the British nuclear test veterans who have children that are born with uh, um, uh, disabilities because of the nuclear test that, uh, uh, dust that fell on top of them. Um, basically, uh, she she was that she was the UK um, sort of uh, expert in the court case, you know, hmm. and 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 she was being debunked, and they had to pull the the video on the BBC because it was so wrong. They did it quietly. I mean, I noticed it. I was one of the people that, that complained about it. But there was re- some really good top-notch people that, that are into nuclear energy. But they said that, that, that she was completely wrong, even by their standards. Okay? So, so there's a huge fight going on. And in fact, actually, if I can mention the British nuclear test veterans, um, uh, there's a court case on there. And you had Chris Busby on one side and Geraldine Thomas on the other. And uh, it, it was finalised in around uh, about August, uh, a bit before maybe. But the bottom line was, though, 
after it finished, we should have had a, uh, the judge should have sat down and said, right, we're going to, uh, you know, in six weeks' time, I'll give you my judgment. It's about six weeks it takes to do the judgment because he's been looking at all the evidence. It takes him six mm-hmm. weeks. Uh, just, I remember that. That's where Chris yeah. Busby was actually the attorney. He couldn't go in as a witness, a witness. expert, yeah, yeah. but he, he, but he a, could he go had, in as an attorney. Yeah, yeah, there was four other experts that went in. And, and, right. Uh, so uh, what uh, happened with that? What did happen? What with happened that? with that is that we're still waiting. You know, this is like over three months. Mm-hmm. Later, mm-hmm. we're still mm-hmm. waiting. And uh, but what I will say, I found out was that the um, the uh, Ministry of Defence, who who represented Geraldine Thomas, actually made a representation afterwards, after the case had been finished. Now, okay, that's a bit unusual, but but okay, so they they made that because they know they're losing it. So, uh, but they made that, and then Chris found out about it. He said, "Well, look, I, I need to answer that." And the Ministry of Defence went to the judge and said, look, you can't get, you know, you, you can't allow him to, to respond to this uh, new evidence we've got. And, uh, and he did anyway. The judge said, yeah, no, you can, because by law, if you bring in some stuff after the court case, then the, the, the defence, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 uh, the other side have to be able to, to uh, rebut it, you know. So that did happen. But now, well, you know, it's just waiting and waiting and waiting. And now, of course, we've got the, uh, in England, they've brought in some really draconian sort of laws. Uh, mm-hmm. They can be spied on, they can hack your phone, they can get in. They've been doing this anyway, by the way, but uh, that's another story. Um, but but basically, um, and we can't talk about it until the court case is resolved, but there'll be some really interesting information from Chris and myself, actually, because I witnessed some stuff, actually, while I was there. But the, bo- the bottom line is, though, is that uh, we're, we're waiting to see uh, what the result will be from this. But but now that you know the judge can be hacked, you know <laughs> his phone can be, you know, and they can probably put on heavy pressures and all this. All this is going on behind the scenes. The Ministry of Defence is very powerful. And they've got the Tory government backing them up to the hill. You know, pro pro Trident has built some nuclear weapons to defend itself from the evil Russians. You know. Um, and all this sort of nonsense. Um, so basically, that's what that's the that's what's going on. And uh, you know, the fact that the judge didn't turn around after six weeks and say, "Yes, we'll find in favour of the defendants the British nuclear test variants and their and their their families for you know twenty generations or and more," um, uh, but they but they haven't they haven't. And neither have they turned around. And the, well, what's uh, the what's the turnaround time in British courts? I know six here weeks. six weeks. Oh, it is here. You see, you're looking at a standard. Normally, in the United States, a case like that would take three to six months. Yeah, the, the case it, the case itself has been going on, and it's been uh, there's all sorts of shenanigans, um, which are just too long to go into here. But uh, basically, it's been going on for about you know a decade or more. Um, wow. And and it's yeah yeah. So this was the final. This year was the final, and uh, the the information was clearly set out. Uh, but what it is, of course, is that you know how can the judge? You know, this is my own personal opinion. You know, this has nothing to do with Chris's. I don't know what Chris thinks about this or whatever. This is my own personal opinion, just looking at it from the side. But how can the judge take the word of Geraldine Thomas, who's, who's known to be not a nuclear uh, expert at all, even though the BBC promotes her. And, and I will tell you why the BBC promotes her, right, in my opinion, is the fact that there's something called the Science Media Centre. And in America, there's something called Sense About Science. And it comes back to why I started doing this all in the first place. Now, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you went into a, a degree course in science media journalism. You'd learn how to be a journalist, but you'd also do another module, which would be learning how about the science. So you'd, be, you'd have science modules, and you'd learn how to be able to read uh, a, a, a study that's been done, like Timothy Masseau or, or mm-hmm. Suda, and you'd read it, and you'd contact them like I did, and they'd give you a response, and you'd be able to rebut what's being said, and you'd be able to do a balanced sort of uh, article on it. And that we used to get that you know, um, 10, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, now what happens is, I was talking to a young man who was doing a, from Japan, who was doing a, a science media journalist course. Now what happens is, is they actually go, they, they're not taught to do that. They're taught to go to the science media center, experts, who are all, you know, science media center is a charity and it's paid for by the likes of EDF, you know, <laughs> the British Nuclear mm. Schools, 
Um, mm, the IAEA, well. no doubt. Oh, yeah. uh, not, oh, not the IEA, no, no, but uh, but certainly EDF and many other sort of nuclear energy uh, suppliers. And I went to this page that you just mentioned, Sense About Science. There's a thing on here that says post-truth debate. Oh, yeah, they'd be into post-truth without a doubt. Transparency now, but, of evidence. Yeah, yeah, totally. But see, what they, what, what they, what they, what science media tend to do is they go to the newspapers and, and to the, hmm. the media outlets and they say, look, d- don't, you don't want to sort of talk to these, uh, independent journalists and you, you know, what you need to do is talk to the only talk to the experts because they know right. what's up. You know, That's we, right. we, we have the right science. Now, the whole point about science is that, that, yeah, if you've got a theory, you know, you've got a theory that, that radiation is good or bad for you, it's a theory. And the theory, and it never becomes a fact because in science it stays a theory and, a, you know, basically the, uh, the theory is argued over time. Okay, so that's that's what that is what science is about. This is what the, this is what this link says. So, this was printed December second, two thousand and sixteen. New standards published today by the Cabinet Office will ensure that grants will be effectively managed across the government. There's a new set of standards for granting the standards. Yeah, and, and so, mm. so but the point the point is it's all to do with this this uh, control. Me, you know, sort of uh, corporate control, if you like, off off the media mm-hmm. and the outlets. That's why we come up with silly, silly uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of headlines that uh, radiation is benefiting the birds in uh, in Chernobyl, for instance. You know, and the scientists mm-hmm. who did the paper said, no, that's not right. That's really taking it out of context. You know, so so the bottom line is is that that they don't even care what the scientists say. They just read a bit of the the, the actual journal, the article that's in the journal, uh, that's that's peer reviewed, and they'll just take the bit out they want. They, they'll cherry pick, and, mm-hmm. and that, that is that you know that that is a is very much a PR thing going back to WPP LLC and Science Media Center, which I I've written on extensively in NuclearNews.net. And 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 uh, others have as well. In Australia, they they in Australia, one of the who was somebody who was a proper science media journalist in Australia turned around and said, "Well, I'm, uh, I'm I, I can't do this anymore because at the end of the day, all I do is I get uh, I get sued, or my my editors turn around to me and say, "Well, look, we've got to let you go, you know, if, if you're going mm-hmm. to if you're going to write that story." So there's huge pressures and. Uh, and 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 so science media center, uh, science media journalism the, the the real thing of it you know the, the going and looking at both sides and reading the the actual scientific data and coming up with uh, with uh, the truth or near as the truth as we can find it, it doesn't happen anymore you know so so it, that's that's really why i got into what i'm doing is because you know I, i'm not a, i haven't done a degree in journalism but uh, but i have a background in science um, I'm an engineer, so at the end of the day, it, it did take a bit of time to get around. Uh, you know what? You know the nuclear industry and its little shenanigans. Um, you know, especially when you're looking at epidemiology, you're looking at uh, atmospheric, atmospheric dispersion and what have you. And of course, I, because I've been covering all these different aspects of the nuclear industry, you know, the nuclear actual nuclear workers that read my blog and read other blogs that, that are similar. Uh, they basically go there because they know that they, that, you know, if you're, if you work in the nuclear industry, you work in a very small area, you know. So, for instance, if you're, if, if you're one of the guys that go out testing things, yeah, you know about that. But you don't know about, uh, about the technical stuff that's going on or releases that are going on necessarily in the nuclear industry. And the same way, if you're working in the nuclear power plant, you don't necessarily know what's coming out and what damage uh, stuff that's coming out of the stacks of a nuclear power plant and the other releases through water like tritium and all this other stuff. So at the end of the day, that, that's kind of, that's kind of what, you know, that, that's, that, so, so it really is neat. Do you spend a lot of time doing blogging? It sounds like you do spend a lot of time blogging and posting and, sure. I mean, it's kind of like a part-time job for you, isn't it? Uh, well, to be honest, it, 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 there's been times, you know, where it's been a full time job. And, you know, I think, it, mm. you know, I'm obviously I, I got um, I got chased out of the UK, basically, a long story. Maybe we'll cover it one day. But um, I moved back to uh, Ireland. And, you know, that's where my family were from. And it, I thought it was a safe place. It was number seven on the um, 
the uh, Press Freedom in te- Index, and whereas the UK's 40, and I think the US is 70 or something, you know, it's way yeah, down. Well, yeah, it's not so much. I have to say, I, it's interesting because, like a lot of with your blogs, I mean, as an American, I'll be very frank with you. I don't respond because I don't want our government to know what I'm thinking. Exactly. I mean, we have some of the I quietest, mean, we it's have some, really bad, but. We, we have some of the quietest comments, you know, sections. We never get any Japanese commenting. They do read and they do take it in. Mm-hmm. You won't comment because there's a Japanese secrets law. And I'm just not going to comment. I don't want, I, I mean, I. I don't want I don't want to be chased after because I'm standing up for the right thing on a newspaper because the people that are going to attack me they're paid to do it and they really honestly they have no regard for human life as far well, as I'm concerned they're all genociders if, if you, I mean I've had a I've had a few arguments well quite a lot I've had stacks of, I've had hundreds of arguments have you just, convinced any of them have uh, you well, convinced I, I, anybody I think, well, to like last... turn from their ways of evil and protecting I mean in my view nuclear can, is can, unequivocally well, I can, I'll evil. Claim one recent victory I had, it was on the, the Canary, and they did a nuclear story. It's an English uh, 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 journal. And they, they had a nuclear story. Uh, they're usually sort of left-wing sort of politics stuff, but they put one up every now and again. Um, and they're actually advised by the Science Media Centre. They have to be because of something called the Leveson uh, Inquiry. But anyway, that's a long story. Um, but anyway, so I was I engaged um, uh, somebody. Well, I actually made a comment. And then that comment came as no, no, no. There's no, no, uh, no health effects uh, from uh, radiation. And so we got into it. We got into it, and uh, we did about. Uh, I did about forty comments. Uh, but I was. I ended up having having a fight on that one. It wasn't too bad. There was only two of uh, the pro nuclear. There's one American, and there's one somebody from the UK. Um, and after, and we we were doing this for two or three or four days because this is how they work. So, but anyway, I was I was engaged with it. I knew, I knew my arguments. Um, and one 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 example of an argument, and I was saying, well, Timothy Masso has done seventy peer-reviewed articles that prove that there's damage from radiation. You know, uh, they turned around and said, oh, Timothy Masso, let me look that up on Wikipedia. Oh, he's anti-nuke, so it doesn't count. And I said, well, what you're saying to me then is that seventy peer-reviewed articles do not count. Is that correct? You know, and and I was having an argument with two of them. Anyway, we went on and on, and I was showing them links, and I was saying, "Look, there you are. There's his, there's his peer-reviewed articles." Da 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 da. And in the end, in the end, uh, one of them turned around and said, "Well, uh, actually, maybe both of you were right." That was the English guy. Actually, uh, the American one was was just adamant that there couldn't be anything wrong with uh, any health effects of radiation. But the English guy, he, he started That's completely, off. completely. This is the thing. Have they just completely ignored all the work from Dr. Linus Pauling, uh, uh, Dr. They, they John would never Goffman. ever read that because they they do a quick Wikipedia. Google and find out his anti nuke and then just just dismiss it. You know, the, well, the fact, that, you the fact I, that you've got the, peer reviewed articles that that by the way to peer peer review one article, uh, you will have all these people uh, at the moment. For instance, to, to see uh, Toshida Suda in Japan who's doing this thyroid study. If you go on to his uh, his uh, online article, you know his online journal report, which is. Uh, um, absolutely free. Anybody can look at it and read the whole thing. You know, it's uh, commercial Creative Commons. And if you look at it, you can see uh, some. You know, you can see about four people, five five people, are arguing with him, right, um, on this. You know, on various points. And they'll be doing this for about two or three years, and they're paid very well to do it. One of them is a guy called Richard Wakeford, and Richard Wakeford is the guy who actually uh, gives Geraldine Thomas her advice on epidemiology and dose okay wow. <laughs> so it's a, we- a wicked web we weave now j- in fairness to Richard do you, Sean excuse me let me interrupt you do you have this book by Dr. John Goffman it's called Radiation from Medical Procedures and the Pathogens of Cancer and Ischematic Heart Disease no no when I left when I left the UK I was earning well before I well, when, when I got into this I was earning 800 pounds a week I, I presume that well look when we're off of dollars, there, send, and uh, send, I had books and I had a home and everything else. I'll send you when this I left, book. I'll just let me go. when I left the book. UK, I basically uh, picked up uh, two bags, right, and I left all of, all my other possessions. Uh, and when I came to Ireland, I had two bags in my hands. And one, one there was somebody from Any News who actually paid uh, for a hotel for me for a couple of weeks, and and then there's a whole story behind that as well. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, no, I don't have any books. 
Well, I'm going to send you this book. I want you to send me your address off the air. I'll mail you this book. I can I get them all the time to mail out to people who can understand the science because it's all this data. Dr. Goffman has the data. He went to extensive work trying to get the data in writing in books. It's here. We don't need to beat an old dead horse. We already know it's harmful. Low dose radiation is harmful. And it's scientifically proven in the 50s and 60s. And there are books written that are available on the net, at least for me, for like five, ten bucks. They're not very expensive. I, so I, 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 I will say, you don't need to do that, because at the end of the day, there's, there's new evidence come out. And, and one of the really interesting things I might as well mention is uh, that, uh, and, and, and it's quite interesting actually, is in 1970, well, the Hiroshima study, which all this dose thing is based on, the ICRP dose model, uh, which is used in hospitals and in nuclear accidents and everything else, um, is basically uh, based on a study of epidemiology on the survivors of the Hiroshima bombing, all right, the Hiroshima mm-hmm. bomb. Now, in 1973, uh, some, uh, the nuclear industry looked at it and they said, oh, the control, now in epidemiology, you have a control group, which is a group living in a clean area, and you have, um, what's it, you have, uh, uh, this, the, the actual, um, uh, information from people that were in the, uh, dirty area where, where the radiation is. Now, what they did, they looked at it and said, oh, that Japanese, uh, control group, they're way, way too healthy. And so what they did, they, they, they scrapped the control group, moved it over to, um, what was it, moved it over to a more, more uh, sort of uh, radiation-soaked people, and then then redid the epidemiological study, which meant that the, that uh, the actual damage from radiation was hidden. Okay, and I, I've got a lot of examples of this. I mean, in polydactyl, um, in Chernobyl, uh, the Western version is that the, that um, there's there's not much difference in polydactyl. There is a little bit, but not much. Uh, in in the Russian study. All right, and they all they only in in the Western study they only deal in percentages, by the way, not numbers. Now in the Russian study they deal in numbers, okay. And I looked at the two of them and I realised that the Russian study was done over a ten year period, and basically for the first seven years it was quite manky, it reduced, it reduced, it reduced, and after ten years, uh, basically you could see, and this is after you know uh, after Chernobyl, you could see that there was a quite a big drop off, right? The Western study. Right, was done over 15 years, okay, and only included percentages. Now you could see how that might, you know. So they basically they, they stuck on another five years uh, of where there was very little uh, uh, polydactyl, and so therefore when they sort of looked at the whole thing, you know, they could say, oh, well, there's hardly any difference. Whereas the Russian study would turn around and say, well, actually, you know, there was a significant difference. You know, and in terms of epidemiology, that's a big thing, but in in terms of numbers. The numbers, oddly enough, worked out there was about 50 children a year initially born with polydactyl after Chernobyl, and there should only be two or three per 100,000, okay? But there was actually 50 altogether in that area, um, and it's quite a large area, but um, I think it was, um, well, anyway, the, you know, the sort of area of Belarus where it was badly hit, and some of Ukraine and some of Russia. So they looked at those those numbers and they turned around and they said, well, look, you know, the the, uh, the, the the cases of polydactyl are actually 50 a year. And funnily enough, that's what we had for the first two years after Japan. OK, so, you know, uh, all I'm saying is you go back there in 10 years time, the, there'll probably be, you know, 10 or five you know, per hundred thousand, you know. Um, and, and so you can really play with the figures and all you've got to do is extend the amount of time if you know that there's a, a short lived effect which well the other part of all of this too is we have not lived eight or nine generations as animal species have done you know what I mean like Helen Caldicott reiterates this all the time we don't really see the real worst of the mixes don't come in until many generations later and because of the way it works in our DNA it can't it, it may skip a few generations but then it'll get progressively worse it's it's an unknown and it is a killer that's the that's the whole issue is well, that I, we're I, really I, messing with something that ought not to be messed with period. Oh, I, I totally agree i mean i think they should shut them down you know because they're, they're huge, and they're I, we also need yeah. scientists to start spending yeah. money on how to solve yeah. it and how to fix it sean we have about seven minutes left i just want to kind of give you that heads up we've been on the, sure. the show now we're almost done so uh, is there any other other points you want to mention 
that's what I was about to ask you. Is there anything that you really wanted to talk about? Like, I think it's important for us to, this has been the good part about since post Fukushima. It not only woke up Fukushima and rattled those nuclear power plants and blew them up and created the worst catastrophe on the planet. That's still ongoing. It's actually woken up a lot of people like myself who really had no idea and no concept. I actually believed the government before Fukushima that everything was perfectly fine. Now I'm kind of uh, having my Scooby-Doo moments all the time, like, like, for real, is it that bad? And so... I really think we need to organize, and we need to organize around a theory of love. Like we need, I really believe that if we're going to get through this time, we have got to, the reason that we're doing it is we love our planet. The reason we can't forget about this is because we love our children. We want our species to thrive. Well, we do We do have a lot of problems uh, coming our way, whether it's climate change or, or radiation uh, from uh, nuclear power plants or accidents and many or other things. <clears throat> but I, I would say to people, I would say to people, you know, if they can, open a blog up and just, just blog up uh, titles, uh, because I believe this works. And, I, you know, I, I think I really do believe this works, by the way, that if you get, you don't have to get any hits on your blog. All you've got to do is you've got to put a title up and let those web bots pick it up and the financial industry will pull away from nuclear even more than it has already. And there's loads of evidence that, that, the, nuclear in, uh, that the financial industry has said, no, no, this is a bad bet. Now, that does leave it with the tax, tax uh, payer, but the fact is, is that the taxpayer is the one that's going to end up with it. Um, so, but let's get the corporations out of the picture. Um, let's take it over. Let's pay the tax to clean it up, close it down, because we're stuck with that anyway. Um, and yeah. then, you know, and it's an unfortunate thing. You know, it's a it's a big con job that the corporations. Well, Sean, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, the hashtags? How to get that out? Okay. We've got five minutes. Okay, for you with uh, for those of you with uh, Facebook or Twitter, if uh, <clears throat> if you have a story and you want to share it. Uh, make make a nice punchy headline, but right at the start, stick in, I don't know, like for instance, I, I did a, a hashtag earlier of uh, TEPCO, hashtag TEPCO, uh, hashtag, uh, um, what's it, uh, CBC, hashtag, uh, what was it, the Japan Times. Um, and, I, and, and when you go over to uh, the hashtag Twitter page, when you Google it, You'll see your post up there, and uh, it will go to the, uh, the the media. They will see it. It will go to Tepco. They will see it, um, and you know certainly try and find out which Twitter uh, pages are slower. Because, like for instance, if you put one on Japan Times, uh, you know the the Twitter feed's quite busy there. But if you put it on hashtag Tepco, uh, it it will uh, it'll lurk. It'll hang there. And, uh, and of course the people from TEPCO can read it. And of course anybody who's, uh, looking up the hashtag, like journalists or whatever, looking up the hashtag TEPCO, uh, sign can, uh, basically find it. And, you know, I, I do things like, uh, uh, hashtag UNHRC, you know, Human Rights Commission, uh, hash, hashtag in my case EUHRC, uh, hashtag uh, well, absolutely. ICRP. <laughs> uh, hashtag IAEA is quite a favourite one of mine at the moment. Um, and it, what it is is that uh, journalists especially uh, actually do use Twitter quite a lot. Uh, you know, this, uh, ask Donald Trump. And, uh, and then basically if you do your hashtags uh, at the start of your Facebook page, within 140 characters, uh, the uh, Google will pick it up and it will, uh, it will lodge it immediately onto the hash uh, the page now if you're a group of people uh you want to stagger the uh, the sharing so that uh, one day one of you puts it up the other day another one puts it up if it's an emergency thing well maybe you could do it an hour apart there's loads of little trends that we can do and you can share uh, articles anti-nuclear articles you know if you share them to force but, the media to actually pick this information absolutely up and, and start and looking at it otherwise it's all left with alternate uh, media and oh, that's Trump. a great idea sean thank you yeah. for giving us that little idea now is it a bad idea to put hashtag iaea hates life will that still be picked up <laughs> yes it will it will but but it's much better to put hashtag iaea 
and then something just leave it. and then something uh, a nice nice uh, a nice little short bit because it's got to be 140 um under 140 right uh, some 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 uh, some pithy headline like you'd find on any news uh, which will draw them uh, towards the facebook page or towards your twitter account and uh, you can hashtag videos and all sorts and they'll go into the hashtag twitter video videos section and all sorts of things like you that. should put out a video on your youtube channel on how to do this and show people how it works oh well if i get tired i will twitter like how do you use twitter like that's one of the things i'm on twitter but i don't i don't quite get how to access a lot of it or how to use it but i do know that when i post and push hashtags up i do get a lot more i have quite a few followers just from having done that of course well twitter is massive at the moment and but for me uh i i'm i you know obviously i don't really go for hits the the people who follow me they're scientists and journalists and things like that so i try to to make uh uh, the stuff I'm doing very clear to them. You know, I, I only have 250 friends uh, on Facebook. You know, Carl Grossman being one actually, um, but there is other other scientists and uh, actors and activists. You know that. that well, uh, Sean, why don't you tell our listeners how to find your work? We've got a minute and a half left. Well, I've I've got a little project I'm working on, which is called European News Weekly, all one word, dot WordPress dot com. And uh, I, I just I'm, uh, that's a little exp- uh, thing. I'm just putting little bits and bobs up, and it's it's to do with uh, my situation. You know, uh, uh, little bits of unfairness I see around me. Um, you'll find articles about Sellafield and little cover up. We have a minute left, so where okay. else? Okay, uh, I'd also say so nuclear dash news dot net uh, obviously uh, I don't post on there too much but I'm, I'm doing a lot of the research behind it uh, and uh, Herve is picking that up and Christina picks it up and of course they're doing their own research as well I, I find that uh, is a very useful blog to check once a day you know you get your 10 posts and you can quickly whip through it and just see what's going on okay so we have like 45 seconds any other way to get in touch with you yep you've got Arclight 2011 uh, which is my YouTube channel where I was doing uh, um, uh, UK uh, nuclear pollution and NO2, which is a big issue, and lead and things like that. Um, and you can uh, check that out. And I've also put some uh, interviews I've done for uh, a, a wide range of people, um, which uh, which is on there as well, Arclight 2011. You've been listening with Lonnie Clark, the Age of Fission radio show. Put your courage feet on. Take some action. It matters. Uh, Sean McGee has been our guest, and we will talk with you guys soon. Thank you.